Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good morning from, from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. I'm very happy to join you in, um, in your big meeting, the Asian Pacific uh, Digestive Disease Week from China. Um, I'm very happy to chair this session on colorectal cancer screening together with my, my dear colleague, um, Han Mo Chu from um, Taiwan. He is currently the uh, clinical professor at the National Taiwan University College of Medicine, and has been the leader for the um, Asian, um, uh, for the uh, Taiwanese um, screening program for, for many years, since 2015, and um, is doing a lot of research there as well. He currently serves as the uh, Secretary General of the uh, GI Society of Taiwan, and is also my co-chair um, for the Asian Pacific region for the colorectal cancer screening committee of the WEO. And I'm very happy he's with us here. I already gave him a long introduction, so I won't do it later. Um, we are looking forward very much to the program of today. Um, it has really, really been um, most of the work from Han Mo, and it's really um, based on all the work that has been done in the past year on the um, uh, on the uh, new um, third Asian Pacific consensus recommendation on colorectal cancer screening. And I think it has been become a fantastic document um, led by Joseph Sung. And I think there's many issues that are great to discuss with you as a public. And I hope also that you will be very happy to um, to um, to to uh, discuss with us later. So please uh, do put in your questions and please try to um, to uh, be active because I think that's what would uh, make this uh, meeting a success. So, um, Hanmo, would you be happy to start the session? Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, Dick, uh, Professor Decker. So, I, I, I would like to welcome all of you to join this session. So, it is my great honor uh, to chair this session together with Evelyn. And uh, 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 he is currently the uh, global chair of WEO Correct Cancer Screening uh, Committee. So I have to express my sincere thanks to WEO and the uh, APW 2022 uh, organizing committee because uh, without their strong support, we are not able to uh, have this session. So as you may be aware, the Asia Pacific Working Group of Corridor Cancer has been elaborating on serial researches on corridor cancer screening since 2005, and published many works, including uh, three consensus recommendation guidelines in 2008, 2015, and this year. It is worthwhile to mention that in the first consensus guideline, we reference it mainly to the clinical evidence from Western countries, and the only general rule for corrective cancer screening were recommended. During the subsequent 15 years, there are accumulating number of clinical evidence from this area, in uh, from this Asia Pacific region, which was included in this third consensus guideline. So we are more than happy to have this occasion to introduce this most updated Asia Pacific guideline in FDW meeting. So today we have totally six speakers and each of the speakers will introduce the statement and the supporting clinical evidences. So hearing, I would like to introduce the first speaker, uh, Professor Joseph Song. So Professor Joseph Fong is currently the uh, Senior Vice President of the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore and the Dean of Lee Kong Chan School of Medicine. And he and his research uh, team had been devoted to the research of Helicobacter pylori, peptide ulcer, hepatitis, and colorectal cancer. And uh, um, his research team pioneered the use of endoscopic treatment for ulcer bleeding to reduce the need of operative surgery. And these research results have a major impact on and have changed the practice of GI uh, worldwide. So uh, the topic of his talk today is uh, confronting the new challenges and uh, embracing new evidences, introduction of the third Asia Pacific consensus recommendation on corridor cancer screening. Please play the video.
Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to present to you our third Asian Pacific consensus on colorectal cancer screening. Colorectal cancer has been a very common cancer, ranking number one or two among the most common cancer in many Asian Pacific countries, particularly in the economically well-developed countries, such as China, Japan, Korea. About 10 years ago, the Asia Pacific Consensus Group, which was uh, composed of about 15 countries in the region, has started to study colorectal cancer in the region. And we reckon that this is one of the most common cancer and rapidly rising uh, cancer incidents in this region. Therefore, in 2018, we have conducted the first Asia Pacific Consensus recommendation for colorectal cancer screening. At that point, we have recommended a population-based screening uh, using either fecal cold blood test or uh, colonoscopy uh, as the primary screening agent. Seven years later, we have an updated uh, consensus done in Hong Kong as well, uh, which is called the Second Asia Pacific Consensus. Uh, recommending on strategy of colorectal cancer screening. Like the first time, we have 15 countries from the region, but we have also invited international experts, uh, including Professor David um, Lipperman, Professor Ernest Kuypers, um, and many others to be with us, giving us the perspective from the international guidelines. And that was also published in GUT seven years ago. Seven years has passed, and we know that there are many um, advancements in our understanding of colorectal cancer screening. But during this period of time, we start to see countries uh, in Africa, in South Asia, as well as in Southeast Asia, have started to have either population-based, organized colorectal cancer screening for the whole population, or opportunistic screening, which means that <clears throat> it is not an organized screening program, but patients who are seeing their family doctors or are seeing patients, seeing doctors for some other reasons, have been invited to join the CRC screening. So countries such as Japan, um, Malaysia, Singapore have started on opportunistic uh, screening. On the other hand, uh, Korea, uh, China, Taiwan, and Thailand has uh, done pilot process of population-based colorectal cancer screening. So we have seen um, more and more actions being taken uh, in this part of the world. We reckon that unlike the other regions around the world, uh, Asia Pacific colorectal cancer screening has certain specific issues. Number one, we have the largest population among the five continents of the world. And most of this, uh, and a large number of this proportion of population are uh, above the age of 50. And that means we have the largest number of uh, people that require screening if we take 50 as the cutoff point. And we do not know exactly when should we stop a screening of this population. And because of the large population and limited uh, resources put into healthcare, accessibility of the program has been another issue. So if we put in uh, a large population for colonoscopy screening, for example, uh, those patients who have other GI conditions that may require colonoscopy will have difficulty to access the service when they are needed. So accessibility, which is uh, related to limited resources, is another problem. The third issue is acceptance and adherence to screening program. Um, as we all know, um, Asian people uh, in general are more conservative about their healthcare uh, uh, um, uh, strategies. That means if we don't have symptoms, we seldom go to see doctors. Therefore, accepting a screening for cancer program when patients do not have any symptom at all uh, has been a challenge for most Asian populations. And after screening for once using fecal immunochemical tests or colonoscopy, 
we need to repeat the test on a regular interval. Adherence to screening program is yet another major challenge. People don't usually uh, follow <clears throat> the guidelines strictly to go for either yearly or bi-yearly uh, stool or cow blood tests or performing colonoscopy surveillance when it is required. We also have um, some doubt about the quality control of screening program, particularly on the quality control of colonoscopy. In some places, colonoscopy is done in great details. Other places, colonoscopy is done in a rush. And we have heard that uh, there are hospitals who have done hundreds of colonoscopy per day, and therefore uh, patients uh, may have missed lesions because of a very uh, rushed colonoscopy procedure being done. So before we can embark on <clears throat> a real uh, effective screening program, assurance of the quality is very, very important. And finally, um, serrated polyps or flat lesion, which is recently known to be uh, a alternate pathway for developing colorectal cancer, is now known to be more and more important as a cause of uh, colorectal cancer development. However, in Asia, there is very little study on this area, and therefore we don't re really know what is the true prevalence of these polyps. And we have also very little guidelines on how often that we should follow these patients who have found to have serrated polyps or flat lesions particularly in the proximal part of the lesions. Now, because of these five major issues, uh, we have decided to conduct the third Asia-Pacific consensus, particularly focusing on how to deal with a very large and aging population, how to improve the quality, and also how to advise on surveillance uh, of the colon with colonoscopy after polypeptomy. Last but not least, how should we deal with serrated sessile lesions? Unfortunately, because of COVID, our experts cannot gather together in a face-to-face -face meeting. So end up in November 2021, we conducted a one and a half day of a Zoom meeting. <clears throat> you can see that um, our old friends, the experts from 15 countries, as well as international experts, um, headed by Dr. Evelyn Decker, uh, Professor Ernest Kuypers and David Lippermans are also here with us. We are also joined by uh, Professor Finlay McRae, who is an expert in um, hereditary colorectal cancer, joining us as well. So today we are going to present to you uh, the third Asia-Pacific consensus statement, which was drafted uh, also based on the modified Delphi process. And my following speakers will give you presentation one by one of those statements. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, um, Joseph. Um, regrettably, Joseph will not be with us for the discussion. Um, However, I think we can uh, greatly discuss all the other topics in, in very much detail and we uh, will be happy to answer your questions also about the setup of the of the um, of this uh, consensus meeting. So um, the next speaker is my dear um, uh, co-chair, uh, Professor Han Mo Chu. I introduced him already. He is uh, a fantastic um, uh, leader in the field of uh, colorectal cancer screening um, for the Asian Pacific countries, but also for the rest of the world. That's why I'm so happy he's my um, co-chair um, for the WEO um, for that whole region. And I look forward very much to, um, to his talk for today on the uh, screening for the general population uh, to whom and how. Please, Hanno. Now I would like to introduce statement number one to number eight together with the supporting clinical evidence. I'm Dr. Hamo Chu of National Taiwan University Hospital. What has changed since the publication of the last consensus guideline in 2015? 
We have experienced a rapid growth in economy and the improved standard of life in Asia Pacific, and we also observed similar trend of increasing trend of young onset corridor cancer that was partially noticed in the U.S. and the Western countries. We are also experiencing expanding screening population because the baby boomer generation has a very big population size, and the Generation X has also entered the screening age. Many novel technologies such as omics, IoT, or AI technology have now increasingly applied in clinical medicine and corrector cancer screening. Accumulating number of evidences from randomized controlled trial and the real-world population screening setting also boost the evolution of the way of providing screening services. This slide shows the association of HDI, the Human Development Index, and the risk of corridor cancer globally. We can see the age-adjusted incidence of corridor cancer is closely related with the degree of economic development and the concurrent westernization of lifestyle. Similarly, in the Asia-Pacific, we can also see much higher incidence of corridor cancer in country or region with higher level of economic development. Statement 1. Risk stratification and the sequential offering of tests are reasonable approaches to corridor cancer screening in Asia. Distinct from direct colonoscopy screening, two-tier screening approach starts from non-invasive screening tests and those who are positive will go for diagnostic colonoscopy. This may tremendously reduce the hurdle of screening in terms of endoscopy manpower and the capacity and the screening uptake. This slide shows the current corridor cancer screening activity in the world. Currently, most of the program used fit the primary screening test, especially in the majority of the EU or Asia-Pacific country and in Canada, whereas some countries like US, Poland, and Germany use colonoscopy for primary screening. Fit is the most popular non-invasive colorectal cancer screening test. It can specifically select people at high risk of colorectal cancer from the large population with single test sensitivity of 80% for invasive cancer and 30% for advanced adenoma. The data from FIT-based Taiwan colorectal cancer screening program revealed that the odds of having advanced adenoma and colorectal cancer were fourfold and nearly 24 respectively compared with the general population. Therefore, Two-tier screening is a very reasonable approach in the Asia-Pacific, where endoscopy resources are rather limited. Statement 2. Multiple risk stratification systems have been developed and no single stratification method has proved to be better than the others. Asia-Pacific Corrector Risk Score was developed by Asia-Pacific Corrector Cancer Working Group and validated in 15 cities in this area. This scoring system is composed of simple demographic and lifestyle factor, therefore it's very easy to use. It has a very good performance in discriminating the general population to different tier of risk of advanced neoplasm. There are also many other scoring systems being developed in different ethnic groups, and generally their performance was very similar, and none is significantly superior to the others, as you can see from the AUC of around 0 0.6 in this slide. Statement 3. Quantitative fecal immunochemical tests every year or every two years, or colonoscopy every 10 years, are the preferred screening tests in Asia. The effectiveness of reducing colorectal cancer and the colorectal cancer death by annual fit screening and the colonoscopy is very similar, with the latter a bit higher but at the cost of much more colonoscopy. This simulation by the USPSTF is, however, based on the assumption of 100% compliance of screening uptake. A recently published result of Nord ICC trial revealed that the effectiveness of reducing corridor cancer incidence of 80% and the corridor cancer mortality of 10% in the intention to screen analysis, which was much lower than we expected. 
This is possibly caused by the low compliance to direct colonoscopy screening in this trial. Such a result highlighted the significance of public acceptance and the preference of the screening test and should be carefully addressed while launching a population screening program. In the feedback population screening in Taiwan, the 10-year result of this program revealed a very significant 35% reduction in colorectal cancer mortality and a 29% reduction in the instance of advanced stage colorectal cancer under 60% of ever screening rate and a 70% diagnostic colonoscopy rate. Although this is not a randomized controlled trial and the safe selection biases were avoidable, this valuable result provides the real-world effectiveness of two-tier colorectal cancer screening using FIT as the primary screening test. Statement 4. There are insufficient data for stool or blood-based molecular tests and the capsule colonoscopy and the CT colonoscopy in Asia to be recommended as the primary screening tool. Although CT coronography could make up the main part shortage in screening colonoscopy and with comparable performance in detecting colorectal neoplasm for those size 6 mm or larger, it is still not very popular in Asia, especially in screening settings. Previous study revealed that the participation rate of colorectal cancer screening was 34% by CT coronography and 22% by colonoscopy, which was significantly higher with the former. There are some drawbacks by CT coronography. A Dutch study revealed that the expected burden of invitee was higher with colonoscopy screening, but the perceived burden of screening participants was higher with CT coronography, as ingestion of projective agent is still required for CT coronography, and those who had polyp or tumor being detected by CT coronography still require diagnostic colonoscopy. A study from Japan revealed that the sensitivity of CT coronography was lower for flat lesion and there was a lower sensitivity in detecting small flat lesion by radiologists as compared with GI doctors. And finally, there are still many Asia-Pacific countries that are still using double contra barrier enema as the backup exam for colonoscopy in their fit screening program and are not ready for using CT coronography in population screening. As for capsule colonoscopy, according to a meta-analysis, its sensitivity for small polyps was lower than by colonoscopy, and the major challenge is its low rate of complete examination. Although multi-target stool DNA test has a very high sensitivity for colorectal cancer, advanced adenoma, and the C cell selective lesion, it has yet been validated in large Asian population and uh, its very high cost is another hurdle for implementing it as the frontline screening test in the organized population screening in this area. There are many emerging broad-based tests for colorectal cancer screening, such as septri 9 which apply methylation markers, but its use is rather limited because of its low sensitivity for colorectal cancer. It is only used for those who are unwilling to undergo frontline screening tests such as FIT or colonoscopy. Some of the new tests combine the cutting-edge omic and AI technologies and are able to detect not only colorectal cancer but also its precursor lesion with high sensitivity. Large-scale validation studies are now still ongoing. Statement 5 there is a rising trend of young onset colorectal cancer in Asia, especially in men and for cancer located in the rectum. A recent study revealed that the increase in young onset colorectal cancer is a global trend that is observed not only in country or region where colorectal cancer incidence is increasing in population older than 50 years, but also in country where colorectal cancer incidence in people older than 50 years is stable or declining. 
such an increase in young onset colorectal cancer is most remarkable in birth cohort after 1960s. The reason of such an increase is however poorly understood. Differences in clinical presentation and the tumor phenotype raise the question of whether young onset colorectal cancer is a different disease with a different mechanism of pathogenesis from colorectal cancer in the older adult or whether exposure to different risk factors such as obesity, change in gut, gut microbiome, or some other might have changed the natural course of colorectal problem. A recent study from the Asia-Pacific region also showed that young onset colorectal cancer is also increasing in this area, especially rectal cancer in the male gender. Statement 6 Lowering the age to start colorectal cancer screening to less than 50 years has not been proved to be cost effective in Asia. American Cancer Society firstly universally lowered the age of starting colorectal cancer screening to 45 years in the general population. By now, many of the U.S. guidelines have changed their recommendation and suggested start screening at 45 for every risk population. A recent cost-effective analysis from the U.S. showed that screening for colorectal cancer starting from the age of 45 is cost-effective. Although colorectal cancer screening starting at 50 and 45 are both cost-effective compared with no screening, the incremental cost per life year gain is much higher for starting screening at 45, especially using colonoscopy as the primary screening modality. Using non-invasive tests such as FIT would be a viable alternative to colonoscopy because it can specify people at higher risk and remarkably reduce the demand of colonoscopy, the most costly part of the entire colorectal cancer screening process. There are, however, lacking real-world evidence on this, not only in the Asia-Pacific, but also in the Western country, and a further study is necessary. Statement 7. Older age per se should not be a reason to exclude healthy individuals from star screening. Statement 8. Screening can be stopped at age 85 if an individual has a recent negative test as they are unlikely to benefit from further screening. In the Asia Pacific, some programs have upper age limit for colorectal cancer screening, but others don't. But it is becoming an important consideration with the increasing size of aging population in many countries in this area. Firstly, we should bear in mind that the benefit of colorectal cancer screening does not come very soon, and we should take the life expectancy or healthy life expectancy into consideration as there are many competing risks of death along with increasing age. From the population demographic, we can see that the aging population is rapidly increasing in Asia, but the working age population is declining. Much more attention should be paid to such an imbalance in population demographic as more healthcare resources are spent on the elderly population, but the healthcare revenue are from the population with working age. Such a trend is expected to worsen in the upcoming decades, and we should very carefully consider not only the effectiveness, but also the cost-effectiveness issue in colorectal cancer screening. Colonoscopy-related complications such as bleeding or perforation or anesthesia-related cardiopulmonary complications are higher in the elderly population and may compromise cost-effectiveness of colorectal cancer screening. Therefore, USPSTF recommend that the clinician could provide an individualized screening recommendation for those aged 76 to 85, considering their prior screening history and the general health condition and the comorbidity because the benefit of universally offering screening for the elderly is small and sometimes the harm would exceed the benefit. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Okay, now I introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Finlay McCray, and he is currently the director of uh, bowel cancer screening program at Royal Melbourne Hospital, and he has devoted uh, for hereditary uh, colorectal cancer research. So uh, the topic of his talk today is screening and the surveillance for the high-risk population, the ignore field in colorectal cancer screening. Finlay, please. Good afternoon. I'm addressing statements 9, 10, 11 and 12 of the recent Third Asia Pacific consensus recommendations on colorectal cancer screening and post polypectomy surveillance. These statements address screening for individuals with a family history of colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas. My name is Finley McRae and I'm head of colorectal medicine and genetics at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. The topics of these statements relate to family history ascertainment, the multiple, situation with multiple first degree relatives with colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas, those with a first degree relative with early aged onset colorectal cancer or older age colorectal cancer. Statement nine indicates that healthcare providers should always explore the family history of patients with colorectal cancer for the possibility of hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes. There was uh, substantial agreement in the Delphi process and this was largely not controversial, controversial, but it did presume knowledge of hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes. High risk genes responsible for syndromic colorectal cancer include those responsible for adenomatous polyposis conditions such as the APC gene and biallelic NIT-YH mutations, the hematomatous genes and the mismatch repair genes MLH1, MSH2 and MSH6 together with POLD1 and POLE. Moderate risk genes can be separated from this where the penetrance is not as high. Good morning and, the fourth and I'd like to thank the scientific PMS2 and P10 responsible for Cowden syndrome. Then there's a group of modest risk genes, such as the I1307K single nucleotide poly, poly, uh, polymorphism in APC, check two mutations and monoallelic MUTYH carriers who have a modest risk. And then there's a collection of single nucleotide polymorphisms, which in combination can be represented as a polygenic risk score, which also provide information on risk for familial colorectal cancer. Statement 10 indicates that subjects having two first degree relatives with colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas diagnosed at any age should start screening at 10 years before the age of diagnosis of the youngest affected first degree relative or at age 40, whichever is earlier, earlier, with colonoscopy every five years. Inclusion of advanced adenomas is equivalent to colorectal cancer for the determination of familial risk is a new aspect of the recommendations. The type of screening at initiation is not specified, but the frequency of colonoscopy is, once that is introduced, every five years. The Australian guideline starts with occult blood testing at the age of 40 and transitions to colonoscopy at the age of 50. This statement had good, good agreement in the Delphi process with the quality of evidence of 2-2 and reached a recommendation of classification A. There is a lot of data available to indicate the risk in relatives of colorectal cancer here we can see a population-based controls study where the risk to the first degree relatives of index cases with colorectal cancer was compared with the risk to relatives, first degree relatives of population-based controls without colorectal cancer, finding that the hazard ratio to those first degree relatives overall was 1.79 
the risk to the second degree relatives was also elevated statistically at 1.32, as was first degree first um, level cousins at 1.15. And the combination of those relatives, such as two first degree relatives, attracted an even higher risk, not represented here. However, the risk to spouses, genetically not related, was not elevated. The Australian guidelines uh, it, uh, translate this, this data into a recommendation of starting at the age of 40 with occult blood testing and commencing colonoscopy at 50 with a flat strategy unrelated to the age of onset in the index case. A contribution, an important contribution has come from Hong Kong of the familial risk of patients with advanced adenomas, not colorectal cancer, but advanced adenomas. Here you can see that they compared the risk of advanced adenomas in first degree relatives of index cases with advanced adenomas, 400 of these people, with the risk in first degree relatives for advanced adenomas in controls who had neither colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas. And here, the odds ratio was 6.05, substantiating that the risk is not just related to relatives with colorectal cancer, but also those with advanced adenomas. A large study from Sweden also supports this. Here is the risk of the colorectal cancer in the average risk population. And here is the risk where there is a first degree relative with colorectal cancer or an advanced adenoma, here represented as in situ colorectal tumour. And you can see that the risk in the first degree relatives is virtually the same, whether the index case has an invasive cancer or an advanced adenoma. Statement 11 is that subjects having one first degree relative with colorectal cancer or an advanced adenoma diagnosed under the age of 60 should start screening at 10 years before the diagnosis in the youngest affected first degree relative or age 40, whichever is earlier, and colonoscopy should be done every five years. This also reached a high level agreement with good quality of evidence and a classification recommendation A. So again, you can see that advanced adenomas are treated equivalently to colorectal cancer for the determination of familial risk. The start age for screening is differentiated by age of diagnosis in the proband or index case. And, but one should note that although there is clear evidence of increased risk in this group, there is limited direct evidence, but some which I'll outline, that the onset of colorectal cancer in the relatives is related to the age of onset in the program. So the alternative strategy of a flat introduction of screening in the at-risk relatives not related specifically to the age of onset in the program, such as in Australia and Sweden, um, is uh, also in place in some countries. The type and frequency of screening is not specified. And I've, as I've said before, this is occult blood testing from 40 transitioning to colonoscopy at age 50 in Australia. So the relationship between the age of onset of colorectal cancer in the index case and the risk in relatives ha has um, attracted quite a lot of attention in the literature here. An analysis of 63 studies from our Hong Kong uh, colleagues evaluating 9.28 million subjects. Here, the overall risk of colorectal cancer in first degree relatives, regardless of the age of onset in the index case was 1.76. But for those where the index case was diagnosed under the age of 40, compared to those older than 40, the relative risk was 3.29. Whereas a slightly higher age group, uh, those that were diagnosed um, uh, between with a family history less than 50 in the index case compared with over 50, the risk was also elevated 
uh, at 2.81, but not as high as the younger age in the index case. So Samada studied this again from the Utah population base, identifying 100, nearly 127,000 patients who underwent colonoscopy of whom 3,804 were diagnosed with colorectal cancer and defined as the index cases. And the risk was greater for the first degree relatives of these individuals when the index case developed colorectal cancer at a younger than age 60. Here, the relative risk was 2.11, whereas where if the index case was over 60, the risk was still higher and statistically higher, but 1.77. Samada also evaluated the age of relatives and ages of index cases in a smaller cohort uh, where, the, uh, where the highest risk was found in young relatives, index cases less than 50, who also in their relatives themselves developed early aged onset colorectal cancer with a hazard ratio of seven. Perhaps the best demonstration of this relationship between risk in relatives and of those stratified by age in the index case is demonstrated in this large study of over 12 million relatives from 174,000 colorectal cancer cases. And if one accepts that a threshold for the introduction of screening in the average risk population is about the age of 50, and this is common across the world, although perhaps diminishing and getting lower uh, in the North American experience. But if we accept 50 as the threshold, then if we look at relatives of people um, with an index, uh, relatives of index cases who developed bowel cancer at age 70, you can see that the, the relatives uh, attracted that same threshold of risk that would justify an introduction of screening at about the age of 45 or 46. And if you take it right back to the, where the index case develops bowel cancer under the age of 45, then the risk to their relatives reaches this same threshold of acceptance of introduction of screening at about 33 years of age. So here we do have evidence to support the introduction of screening in relationship specifically to the age of onset of cancer in the index case. Gupta also evaluated this within the colon family register and showed that 44% 40 of all colorectal cancers meeting criteria for early age of screening initiation had their bowel cancer diagnosed at the same age as the youngest first degree relative with colorectal cancer. Taking it from another angle, he also looked at the sensitivity of the various North American guidelines for detecting early age onset colorectal cancer in people under the age of 50 uh, with the application of those guidelines. And only 25% of those early age onset colorectal cancers would have been detected with the application of those national guidelines, meaning that 75% of, uh, of early age colorectal cancer would not be identified by introduction of universal screening at 50 or the application of guidelines based on family history. Statement 12 says that subjects having one first degree relative with colorectal cancer diagnosed over the age of 60 should start screening at an earlier age, 50, uh, 40, with the same st test strategy as used for average risk individuals in the jurisdictions concerned. And this also met a high level of agreement and a classification of recommendation A. So this is the other side of the coin, an older aged onset. There's data have we shown that they are also at increased risk and justify screening in the, in the, in the concept of this statement starting at an earlier age. Here's the Samata study that I showed before showing that even if the relative index case is diagnosed over the age of 80, the risk to relatives is increased statistically uh, at 1.76, in, yeah, um, justifying that introduction of screening at an earlier age. All of these recommendations align pretty closely with international guidelines here, the North American guidelines, 
uh, what the Asian Pacific guidelines uh, represent is very close alignment. The North American guidelines do identify the onset of screening at 10 years younger than the early stage of colorectal cancer in the index case across the various risk groups, whereas the uh, Cancer Council of Australia does not. It has a flat introduction of screening age in this, these elevated groups, regardless of the age of onset in the index case. And the European guidelines also don't recognise the concept of introduction of screening in relatives of 10 years younger than the early stage of onset in the index cases. So thank you very much for the opportunity to address you at this meeting. And um, I look forward to hoping to address uh, and answer some of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Uh, yeah. Okay, please. No, I, I think we say the same. We both say that <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Finlay, because it, this was a, a wonderful presentation with lots of numbers, but showing the evidence for um, uh, colorectal cancer screening or, or surveillance as they are supposed to be high risk groups um, in, in uh, individuals with, uh, 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 with family members with colorectal cancer or advanced adenomas. Um, so it's time for discussion and we have... Um, uh, a lot of time. We have 15 minutes. So um, I have many questions. I'm sure Han Mo has them. I'm sure Finlay has them. Uh, but I also hope the audience has has questions and they will uh, send them um, to the uh, organizing uh, committee and, and so we will receive them. So please join us in the discussion. So I think, first of all, I, I would like to head off with a question to, to Finlay. So um, I... Uh, uh, being, you were very clear about the uh, the risks for um, uh, individuals with first degree family members with uh, colorectal cancer. However, what I find always difficult in a screening program, when when putting a, a, a general population screening program in place, how to deal with this topic? Because if you invite the population, you are usually not informed about any increased risk. Um, and by trying to um, to um, to make this clear to the population, you might also um, worry them or make them confused, not coming to a doctor or not participating in screening at all. So um, you could give information in an, in, a, in a leaflet. You could ask the, the family doctor to to ask the family history of all the patients. But how would your how would you um, uh, uh, solve this 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 challenge, which is actually I think for already installed programs as well as as new programs, um, really an issue. Uh, thanks, Evelyn. That that's um, a very pertinent question. Um, I think there's it has to be multifactorial the way you approach it. One way would be to link information about family history into the information that's provided to people when they do population-based screening. So they're aware that there is another dimension to screening other than just the occult blood test they're sent that um, reflects on the possibility of a familial risk or indeed a previous um, polyp or cancer history risk. So I think uh, although that produces some complexity to the approach to the average risk population, I think it's important that uh, and it's a mechanism for making the population aware uh, at an appropriate age. Yeah. I, I so guess I the thought... second way, the second Sorry. way is just that our responsibility professionally to inform the, the healthcare community about familial risk through general practice approaches, yeah. through general education, through seminars such as this. Um, just how effective any of those approaches is, I think, is probably what you're getting at um, with respect to um, ascertaining the right people with a family history. But after all, the first statement we made was a statement nine, which was the importance of ascertaining a family history in the population. So I think the recommendations do address it. Yeah, so, so I totally agree with you. 
Um, however, what we found out, because I, I think indeed um, there's, of course, the general uh, awareness of doctors and, and uh, the medical uh, society that, that family history is important and how to do this well. Um, but trying to get more to the public, there is the stage when you invite the, the persons and there's a stage where pay, but when fit positives, for example, in a fit positive screening setting or or in a col primary colonoscopy setting, the moment they come to your clinic and you um, you discuss with the patient about colonoscopy and you would also discuss a family history, right? But the, the issue is that many patients don't understand their family history very well. So we did a trial in trying to um, assess the family history upfront, trying to to indeed filter out those people that should not be in a general screening population setting, but should be taken better care of. And actually, uh, the, um, the detection rate was relatively low. And those that did uh, in the questionnaire answer that they had a positive family history, many were, when checked later by a clinical genetician, uh, wrong in their, their knowledge about their family members. So actually, were not at such uh, an increased risk. So, because the you know they made a mistake in their family history, they didn't understand the type of cancer or or whatever reason. So, I think it is challenging. We we know all this, but the implementation, I think, is 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 rather difficult. Yes, for sure. There's a mismatch between patient recollection of family history and verified diagnoses, for sure. In our genetics clinic, we actually go to the trouble of cross-checking all the self-reported pedigrees against the cancer registry to confirm the diagnosis at the pointy end of the family history issues, i.e. Um, syndromic Lynch syndrome and so on, before we implement um, gene testing. Uh, but that has shades of relevance right down to lesser degrees of family history, like I'm saying, not an easy issue to uh, address, but I think we can just do our best. Um, I, I guess you could argue that it's not too bad a thing to overscreen, although of course there are cost implications associated with that. Yes, thank you. Uh, I agree. Hanmo, do you have a question or should I yes, ask yes. a question to you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I have two questions from my side to friendly. So thank you very much for the very comprehensive talk. So my first question is that uh, I believe that hereditary colorectal cancer is, uh, in the real world is underdiagnosed, underdetected. Uh, but uh, uh, doing the immunohistochemistry stain, the uh, tumor tissue may identify some specific a genetic change for, for example, for Lynch syndrome or some hereditary cancer. So do you think that routine uh, 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 immuno IC stain can help to increase the detection of uh, hereditary colorectal cancer? And is this a, a routine practice in Australia or, or uh, in EU? Uh, another question for uh, Evelyn. Uh, well, if I can pick that up, it's a routine recommendation in Australia. It's a guideline in Australia to test all colorectal cancers for mismatch repair deficiency, oh, okay. either by microsatellite instability or immunohistochemistry. Um, the, the, the pathology community is improving. Um, we have just done a randomised controlled trial, actually, of... Uh, introduction of implementation, scientific approaches to implementing routine testing, which monitored what the status was before that was done. And it's actually not too bad in most of the dozen or so Australian hospitals that were involved in that uh, cluster randomised control trial. Uh, but it is patchy still. There are, there are some places that are better than others in Australia. Um, I think that we are moving though towards a situation of universal germline testing for bowel cancers, bypassing, well, not necessarily bypassing, but using germline testing uh, as a primary step. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for that. One is the cost has come down considerably. 
for doing germline testing. The cost of immunohistochemistry and microsatellite instability testing is not trivial. Uh, it's in the hundreds of dollars to do it. And the cost of germline testing is only a few hundred dollars more. And the benefit, and we've published this recently on the, uh, the prevalence of Lynch syndrome detected either by universal germline testing or tumor testing is nearly double if you go straight to the germline. So uh, there, there's, a, there's a strong argument developing to go straight to the germline and the cost benefit analyses are uh, you know, st starting to support it as the cost differentials diminish between the two, two approaches. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Avery, how about uh, in in Netherlands or in EU countries? Uh, yeah, it's difficult. The balance is is difficult. I'm, I'm, can I go further because we don't have a lot of time, and I would be very interested, Tan Mo, in your vision uh, yes. on the um, on the 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 recent Nordic paper. You you alluded a little bit on that, but I think. It, I, I've been in discussions uh, on the Nordic paper um, to make clear that's about the effectiveness of colonoscopy, um, and uh, which which was not as high as we expected for many reasons that we can discuss in more detail. But especially in the United States, that this has um, uh, has um, uh, uh, driven a, a big discussion on col a colonoscopy effectiveness. Right? Can you explain a bit more about maybe the Asian Pacific? Uh, receipt on that or yes okay so uh, basically in the pacific area we use the fit of the primary screening test so we don't have much uh this kind of uh, of issues but uh in uh i heard that uh in korea uh, some of the doctor are uh, advocating to start colonoscopy based screening so there is a debate between uh, whether a colonoscopy uh, could be used as a uh, primary screening test, especially in Asia Pacific, we had a very low price of colonoscopy, so it looks uh, feasible. But uh, after looking at the uh, New England Journal of Medicine paper, uh, we think that uh, public acceptance uh, should be uh, clarified first, especially that in previous randomized control trial, um, the screening uptake uh, of uh, colonoscopy by Asian population is not so high. So we are yeah. afraid that, yeah, uh, we if we, we use colonoscopy-based screening in this area, yeah, the detection of cancer will be the same or even lower than, than, than using FIT, yes. Yes, so, so again, it comes to, to pro programmatic screening, right? The moment you have the patient in your office, you can probably offer a relatively good colonoscopy with effectiveness from that, right? But it yeah. all comes to how to approach the whole population and also the most at-risk population, which is usually not the person that comes to your room to ask you for colonoscopy, right? Yeah, yes, so, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this, this would favor, again, a non-invasive test. And I think that would be nice, like uh, the combination of you and Finlay. So we haven't discussed, you, you've touched a little bit on it, but how about the future of, of all of this. I mean, we're now doing mostly in programmatic settings fit because of the higher participation rates. Um, uh, but is fit, I know we have, has uh, you, you said it yourself, an 80% sensitivity uh, specificity that's higher, that helps us a lot in the capacity for colonoscopy. But where are we heading? And are we heading towards other non-invasive tests? And would that not also be very useful in all Finlay's uh, populations that he's addressing with the increased risk and earlier screening. Yes, I think quantitative fit must be implementable, matched to risk. That would seem to be a low-lying fruit for advancement. Um, I haven't yet seen that done, um, stratified by risk, but I think that's that would be a very useful way to, to go forward. Um, I think we've still got to get more data around molecular stool testing, molecular or, or blood testing to be, feel comfortable with that approach. But there is some promise there uh, in either of those directions. 
Evelyn, I think just one thing about the interesting um, colonoscopy randomized control trial and the, the um, juxtaposition of a per protocol analysis with an intention to treat analysis, exactly as you say, the per protocol is the per protocol analysis is relevant to the population you've captured that you've got in your office, whereas the intention to treat analysis is relevant to the total population. Uh, and uh, um, I guess I'd never really thought of it in that in that way before, but it's clear that that's the difference between an intention to treat analysis and a per protocol analysis. Yes, absolutely. And I think what also became very clear from that paper was the varying participation, right? Because that that was really what is hindering the effectiveness in the end. And and I mean, we were in the trial in the Netherlands. We had, however, difficulty after 10 years for privacy reasons to get all the data. But at the same time that in the Netherlands, we were doing colonoscopy screening as a trial, we had a 22% participation rate only at the time when we did FIT trials with 60 over 60% participation rate. So for us, it was very low. And at that exactly same time in Norway, participation rates were 70% to colonoscopy screening. So we were, we were having meetings and my colleagues from Norway, they said, how is this possible? You are chasing your patients. Are you scaring them with colonoscopy? Are you doing a bad job in, you know, in advertising colonoscopy? And we looked at all the information we gave to the public and it was exactly the same. But in Norway, apparently people are just very obedient. And we know that from other, you know, from IBD trials, from many other trials, they're very obedient to whoever tells them what to do in, 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 in medical field. Whereas in, the, in my country, they say, well, colonoscopy, I don't think so. This is a bit too invasive. I don't know anything about my risk. So it's a totally different perception. And that is why screening is such a different field from our daily you know daily gi practice where you see patients that come to you and and ask you for you know for help <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, i think this really really highlights this issue and makes it very interesting for us to to work in this field mm. yeah yeah you've got a market so you've got a market screening whereas you don't have to market clinical practice exactly that's exactly the case yes so thank you so much, uh, Finlay. Um, I think we need to move on to the to the second part of uh, of our um, uh, symposium of today. Very happy to see you, Finlay, and and I hope you stay with us for the for the second part. Thank you. So Hamo and I are happy to start the second um, part of the symposium, and I would like to introduce um, the first speaker, um, who is uh, Yuen Lin. He is uh, working in the uh, Shin Kong Wu Hosu Memorial Hospital, um, and um, he will discuss with us the surveillance after colonoscopy. Um, and his clinical interests are actually mostly in hepatic interventional procedures, diagnostic and therapeutic. But his interests are also lying in the areas of tumor biology, but also colorectal cancer screening and outcomes research. So I look very much uh, forward to his talk on the uh, balancing between effectiveness and clinical capacity of uh, colonoscopy surveillance. So please, uh, Dr. Lin, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction and happy to see you here. So please share my slides. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Lin from Xinguang Wu Hoshi Memorial Hospital, Taipei, Taiwan. It is my great pleasure to join this meeting to meet with so many active members here. And thanks for Professor Decker and the Cho's kind introduction. My topic today is surveillance after colonoscopy, balancing between effectiveness and the clinical capacity, which was narrated in the AP Consensus Statement 13 to 15. I have no COI to be disclosed. There are two parts in my talk. The first part, I would like to discuss on the importance of post polypectomy surveillance for colorectal cancer. Screening and surveillance are important for cancer prevention. The concept 
a colorectal cancer screening is to evaluate of people who are asymptomatic and have no past history of colorectal polyps or cancer. Recommendations for screening will vary depending on the risk of the uh, target population and the expected benefits. And for uh, surveillance is to evaluate asymptomatic individuals with past history of colorectal polyps or cancer or disease known to increase the risk of colorectal cancer such as ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, etc. Recommendations for surveillance will vary based on individual pre-existing medical condition. The aim for cancer screening and surveillance is to reduce incidence and mortality of colorectal cancer. Program design for cancer screening and surveillance should pay attention to define target population, assure the quality, provide appropriate tools at appropriate intervals, and interpret data and then provide evidence. So efficient surveillance has to target individuals at risk and uh, made suggestions at tailored interval. Polypectomy is a common procedure in our uh, daily practice. Either small polyps or challenging polyps can be recepted by experienced endoscopists. And the effectiveness of polypectomy for mortality reduction has been proved. The National Polyp Cohort Study from United States, published in New England Journal of Medicine in year 2012, provides solid evidence. After polypectomy, colorectal cancer mortality could be reduced by 53%. Uh, this outcome is convincing, but still, colorectal cancer may develop after polypectomy, and it raised another issue, who is at risk. And more and more data suggests that risk of colorectal cancer developed after polypectomy might be related to the biology of baseline polyp and the quality of colonoscopy. It is now more clear that more than 50% of PCCLC are likely the result of lesions missed at baseline. Here is an example. At index colonoscopy, uh, there is no abnormal uh, finding, but the colon preparation uh, was poor and some uh, polyp might be missed. Two years later, we uh, offer a surveillance colonoscopy and a uh, adenocarcinoma PT1 was identified. So this uh, case suggests that surveillance colonoscopy may protect the patient from invasive cancer. Despite the improvement of the technique of polypectomy in our daily practice, incomplete polypectomy is still an important factor for PCCRC. The CARE study published in Gastroenterology year 2013 suggests that the incomplete resection rate was not low, ranging from 6.5% to 22.7%. Here is an example. At index chronoscopy, a tubular villus adenoma was removed from this 55-year-old uh, male. Three years later, the surveillance chronoscopy identified an early cancer at the same location. It suggests that surveillance chronoscopy provides protection for patients from invasive adenocarcinoma. Although there is abundant evidence suggests that cancer screening may reduce the instance and the mortality of colorectal cancer. There is only limited data to understand the effectiveness of post-polypectomy surveillance. And this data uh, from UK published in Lancet Oncology in year 2017 showed that for patients with adenoma at baseline, the risk of colorectal cancer could be reduced by about 40 to 50 percent if they had adequate surveillance. I would like to make a brief summary here. Evidence suggests that surveillance after polypectomy can reduce the risk of colorectal cancer. 
and surveillance chronoscopy provides an opportunity to detect overlooked or incomplete resected or newly developed neoplasms before they become invasive or advanced stage colorectal the cancer. Risk stratification uh, for efficient surveillance is crucial for cancer prevention. The first part of my talk emphasized the importance of post-polypectomy surveillance. The Asia-Pacific Colorectal Cancer Screening Working Group made three recommendations in this consensus for surveillance, and I would like to have a discussion in the second part of my talk. The first AP consensus on colorectal cancer screening is published in year 2008. At that time, the evidence addressing the effect of colorectal cancer surveillance is few. There is no statement regarding post-polypectomy surveillance in the first consensus. The second AP consensus on colorectal cancer screening is published in year 2015. At that time, the evidence addressing the effect of colorectal cancer surveillance is limited. There is one uh, statement regarding post-polypectomy surveillance. And in the third AP consensus meeting, we can obtain more evidence from the Western and uh, Asia-Pacific area studies. And we, may, we have uh, three statements recommendation uh, for post-polypectomy surveillance. In the second Asia-Pacific consensus meeting in year 2015, the working group recommended that surveillance interval should be tailored to the risk for colorectal uh, neoplasia. Risk to predict metachronous advanced neoplasia is stratified by the histology, size, and number of the polyps at baseline chronoscopy. High-risk adenomas are defined as high-risk, uh, high-grade dysplasia or Villas component in histology, uh, 10 mm or larger in size, 3 or more in number. Low risk adenomas are defined as 1 to 2 tubular adenomas uh, smaller than 10 mm. However, since there is general lack of uh, prospective data, precise guidelines on uh, interval for surveillance cannot be given at that time. In the third Asia Pacific consensus meeting, we search for the up-to-date evidence from recent published original articles and guidelines or recommendations from academic society including ESGE, USMSTF, and uh, countries uh, in the Asia-Pacific area. Recent studies revealed that the pressure on endoscopy resources for adenoma surveillance was huge. It was reported as 20 to 25 percent in UK and United States, respectively. Though we did not provide data from Asia Pacific area, the consensus members believe that the endoscopy resources in, endos in AP area was limited, and the pressure for endoscopic surveillance for adenoma is high. The recent U.S. Multi Society Task Force recommendations clearly suggest that. For uh, one to two uh, tubular adenomas smaller than 10 mm, the surveillance interval was suggested at a longer period, from seven to 10 years. And for high-risk adenomas, the surveillance interval was recommended at three years after polypectomy. In line with the reported surveillance consensus for individuals with one or more adenomas, the Asia-Pacific Consensus Statement 13 recommend surveillance chronoscopies represent a heavy burden to the healthcare system and to individuals, and the optimal method for surveillance and intervals should be studied in Asia-Pacific area. In the Statement 14, we pay attention to the surveillance chronoscopy after removing a high-risk adenoma. And most of the consensus members in the meeting agree that three-year surveillance interval after removing high-risk adenoma should be recommended. One study from Professor Jeffrey published in year 2020 in gastroenterology can inform current uh, surveillance guidelines for high and low-risk adenomas. With up to 14 years of follow-up, 
high risk adenomas at baseline chromoscopy were associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer and related deaths. Supporting early chromoscopy surveillance is needed. And uh, low risk adenomas were not associated with a significant increased risk of CRC or related deaths. A recent study from Japan, published in year 2021 in GUT, provides suggestions for surveillance after removing adenomas. This is a randomized control trial from 11 centers in the Japan. They enrolled individuals with adenomas and were removed at baseline chromoscopy. Then uh, they are randomized into two groups. One group takes uh, one surveillance chromoscopy at three years and the other group takes two surveillance chromoscopies at one year and three year. The Japan Polyp Study JPS identified several factors such as multiple adenomas, small flat lesions, and the retrospecting tumor. NG type at baseline chromoscopy are associated with a higher risk of metachronous advanced neoplasm. In the meantime, the results also showed that shortening the interval of surveillance chromoscopy offers no significant benefit for identifying more uh, metachronous high-grade dysplasia or cancers. Accordingly, a three-year interval is considered appropriate for Asian individuals after the removal of polyps including high-risk adenomas. In the statement 15, we pay attention to the low risk adenoma. Recent evidence suggests the risk of colorectal cancer was similar to the non surveillance population. Most of the consensus members agree and recommend surveillance for low risk adenomas should be done at intervals as used for average risk individuals by chromoscopy and or fit. This recommendation is novel because we recommend fit at the time interval. This is based on a study uh, from Taiwan. In this community-based population, FIT-based screening program, the FIT positive rate is around 5%. The researchers identify a group of population who has a positive result of FIT and negative findings on conformational chronoscopy. They recommend subsequent fit for this cohort and follow up for five to ten years. This, their results showed that the risk of incident colored cancer after negative chronoscopy, that is chronoscopy interval cancer, can be reduced by subsequent fit in the fit screening program, indicating that fit may play a role in the current cancer surveillance. The third Asia Pacific Consensus Meeting addressed more points on post polypectomy surveillance. However, there are some unmet needs, such as the utilization of polyp surveillance in clinical practice was not clear. The role of intermediate testing, such as FIT or other biomarkers, remained to be determined. And the effectiveness of surveillance chronoscopy remained to be clarified. And there is ongoing research uh, on this important issue, such as the European Polyp Surveillance Trial. This trial will complete uh, at the end of uh, 2028. I think at that time we will have more evidence and confidence to make suggestions on appropriate intervals for post polypectomy surveillance. In summary, the third Asia-Pacific consensus recommendations for post-polypectomy surveillance are in line with the other international consensus such as ESG and the US MSTF. They are summarized in this table. In a FIT screening program, we recommend individuals with positive result of FIT and the normal findings on chronoscopy should return to the FIT screening program. For individuals with low risk adenomas, we recommend to return to a screening program and survey by chronoscopy or uh, by intermediate fit tests. For individuals 
uh, with three or more adenomas, advanced histology larger than 10 millimeters. These are high-risk adenomas, and we really recommend a three-year in interval for surveillance colonoscopy. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lin, for the very comprehensive review of the surveillance. Uh, let's move on to next presentation. We leave all the discussion after three presentation. So next, the next speaker will be Dr. Takahisa Matsuda from Japan. Uh, Professor Matsuda is currently Professor of Medicine in Toho University, Tokyo, Japan. And he is currently the member of uh, Japanese Society of GI and the GI Endoscopy, and also the member of ASGE and the Japanese Society of GI Cancer Screening. And he is the chief conductor of Japan Polyp Study, and his research interest is in colorectal cancer screening, post polypectomy surveillance, endoscopy diagnosis, and treat treatment of early colorectal neoplasm and the image enhanced endoscopy. So uh, he will be presenting uh, statement number 16 to 19 uh, with supporting evidence. The topic is avoid interval cancer and the post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer arising from distinct carcinogenesis pathway. Professor Matsuda, please. Thank you very much, ha Hamo, uh, for your kind of introduction. I'm very happy to see you all a long time, a long time, after a long time. Um, uh, I got here in time. So could you please start my presentation? Hello, everyone. My name is Takahisa Matsuda from Toho University, Tokyo, Japan. It's my pleasure to talk about post-polypectomy surveillance and post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer PCCRC in this session today. My COI to be disclosed are as follows. Today, I would like to talk about importance of post polypectomy surveillance and the characteristics and causes of PCCRC based on the results of our Japan PREP study, JPS. As you can see here, recently colorectal cancer incidence and mortality rates are high in Asia-Pacific region, same as Western countries. In the Asia-Pacific region, many countries have implemented colorectal cancer screening as an organized population-based screening program. All programs use fecal immunochemical test, FIT FIT, as a primary screening test. I would like to present the results of colorectal cancer screening in Japan. We studied population-based colorectal cancer screening using two-day fit for all people over 40 years annually since 1992. In 2016, more than 8.5 million people received this screening program. The low participation rate is a problem, but approximately 650,000 people tested positive for FIT. Among FIT positive individuals, 68.5% underwent total colonoscopy as a diagnostic examination, and approximately 20,000 colorectal cancers were detected. In FIT positive individuals, Neoplastic lesions are found in about 50%, advanced adenoma in about 20%, and colorectal cancer in about 5%. The keys to successful colorectal cancer screening may include the following. Establishment of an quality controlled screening program, high screening participation rate, high compliance of colonoscopy, diagnostic examination rate among fit positive individuals, and effective use of colonoscopy with limited resources. Excessive surveillance colonoscopy strains colonoscopy resources. On the other hand, insufficient surveillance colonoscopy increases the risk of PCCRC. Therefore, 
I believe that proper setting of post polypectomy surveillance interval is very important. Recent US and European guidelines recommend surveillance colonoscopy at three years after baseline colonoscopy if polyps are removed and classified in the high-risk group. The US guidelines provide a particularly detailed surveillance interval based on baseline colonoscopic findings. Both guidelines also take into account slated regions as well as adenomatous polyps in their surveillance programs. As you can see, the Japanese guidelines have more intensive surveillance intervals than the Western guidelines. As for slated regions, surveillance TCS is recommended after three years for those with dysplasia, but after three to five years for others. The third edition of the Asia Pacific Consensus Recommendations published this year describes about suicide related lesions in statements 16 to 19 as follows. As suicide related lesions are premalignant lesions, they should be detected and removed. Suicide related lesions are likely to be underdiagnosed in Asia and should be carefully looked for during chronoscopy especially in the right column. Moreover, detection of cesside serrated lesions may be enhanced by improving awareness of the importance of these lesions and training in their detection. After complete removal of one cesside serrated lesion over 10 mm or a cesside serrated lesion with cytological dysplasia, Coronoscopy should be recommended at a three-year interval. Now, let's move on to the topic of post-colonoscopy corrector cancer, PCCRC. I present one example of PCCRC. Total colonoscopy performed for surveillance after polypectomy revealed type 2 advanced cancer in the ascending column. This patient had undergone colonoscopy one year earlier. This is a typical PCCRC. I deem that non-polypoid region, the novel type depressed cancer, was probably concealed behind the fold. As you know, a consensus statement on PCCRC was published by WO in 2018. The WO proposed an approach for investigating and categorizing PCCRCs detected within four years of a colonoscopy. In 2020, an individual case study of 107 PCCRC cases based on WO classification from a UK hospital was reported. They reported that more than 80% of PCCRCs were missed regions and that PCCRC patients included the relatively larger number of IBD, Lynch syndrome, and a history of colorectal cancer and large adenomatous polyps. According to a report from the Netherlands published in 2014, PCCRC accounted for about 3% of all colorectal cancers, and PCCRC occurs more frequently in the elderly, those with a family history of colorectal cancer, and those with chronic diverticulosis or heart disease. In addition, PCCRC was reported to be characterized flat regions often found in the proximal column and small in size. On the other hand, studies on the molecular biological characteristics of PCCRC have been reported. Comparison between PCCRC and non-PCCRC showed that PCCRC is characterized by more regions with higher percentage of MSI high, SIMP high, and BLAC mutations 
and less careless mutations. These results suggest that serrated regions and non-polypoid regions are more common than polypoid regions as a causative region of PCCRC. Next, I would like to introduce our Japan Polyp Study, JPS, in the sense of exploring the causative regions of PCCRC. Japan Polyp Study, JPS, is a multi-center randomized control trial conducted at 11 participating centers. We conducted JPS focusing not only on polypoid regions, but also on non-polypoid collector neoplasms. Although the primary endpoint of the JPS was to determine the surveillance interval after polypectomy, it was also possible to validate the frequency and clinical pathologic characteristics of metachronous advanced neoplasia that occurred during subsequent three years after two rounds complete colonoscopy before randomization. Let me explain the characteristics of metachronous advanced neoplasia in JPS. Among all 29 advanced neoplasia, there were one invasive cancer, 13 high-grade dysplasia, and 15 large low-grade dysplasia over 10 mm in size. Regarding the location, 45% of advanced neoplasia were located in the right-sided column, 38% were in the left-sided, and 17% were located in the lectum. Morphologically, 62% of metachronous advanced neoplasia were classified into non-polypoid corrector neoplasms, and most of them were laterally spreading tumor non-granular type, LSTNG. The prevalence of sessile serrated lesions in metachronous advanced neoplasia was as low as 3.4%. Recent studies on post-colonoscopy corrected cancer have led to the opinion that serrated lesions in the proximal colon are the main causative lesion of PCCRC. However, we are focusing on the association between PCCRC and LSD non-granular type based on the JPS results. JPS workgroup also conducted a study on the effect of endoscopic polypectomy on corrector cancer incidence. JPS results reported earlier are based on the three years of data after two-round colonoscopy. Now, I will present data from the JPS cohort, which has been followed longer. JPS cohort is a multi-center prospect cohort study of the JPS participants. A total of 1,895 participants were analyzed in this cohort study. 66% were males, and the mean age was 58.7 years. Follow-up colonoscopies after two-round colonoscopy were performed on all study subjects. The mean number of follow-up colonoscopies and mean follow-up period were 2.8 and 6.1 years, respectively. The observed expected over E ratio of corrector cancer was calculated using data from the population-based Osaka Cancer Registry. The primary outcome was corrected cancer incidence after randomization. The incidence was compared with that of population-based OSC cancer registry. Meanwhile, the secondary outcomes were the incidence and the characteristics of metachronous advanced neoplasia after randomization. The observation period of events were between 2004 and 2015. Overall, four patients, all males, contracted colorectal cancers during the study period. The overall ratios for colorectal cancer in all participants, males and females, were 0 0.14, 0 0.18, and 0 respectively. To our knowledge, this is the first study to clarify the long-term risk of colorectal cancer 
and clinical features of newly occurring metachronous advanced neoplasia using high-resolution colonoscopy with advanced optical imaging in an Asian population. Four invasive cancers were detected after two-round colonoscopy. As you can see here, two of these cases were T1 cancers. Clinical pathological characteristics of 77 advanced neoplasia found in the JPS cohort are presented. Among 77 advanced neoplasia, 31 regions, 40% were classified as laterally spreading tumors non-granular type. Non-polypoid corrector neoplasms, including flat, depressed, and LST, accounted for 60% of all detected advanced neoplasia. Meanwhile, two of the four corrector cancers corresponded to T1 non-polypoid corrector neoplasms. In summary, more than 60% of metachronous advanced neoplasia removed by surveillance colonoscopy were classified as non-polypoid corrector neoplasms, especially lateral spreading tumor non-granular type. The prevalence of sessile serrated lesions, SSLs, in metachronous advanced neoplasia was low, less than 5%, in the JPS. One possible reason for this was that we removed all serrated lesions larger than 10 mm in size in the proximal column during baseline colonoscopy. This is the last slide. Corrector cancer screening using fit widely available these days, it's important to make effective use of colonoscopy, which is a limited resource. Therefore, proper setting of the post polypectomy surveillance interval is very important. Although it's important to accurately detect society selected lesions in the proximal column, non-polypoid corrector neoplasms, especially lateral spreading tumor non-granular type was extracted as a causative lesion of PCCRC from the results of JPS. Thank you for your kind attention. I apologize for not being able to participate in the discussion today due to my duty at the university. I'm very happy you uh, are indeed joining us, uh, Takahisa. Um, Thank you. And I look look forward for the for the debate after the next uh, speaker. Thank, Thank you, you so much for this uh, very nice presentation. So the next and last speaker of um, this session is uh, uh, Kai Chan Wu, and he is um, from the Qiying Hospital, the Fourth Military Medical University in China. And he's a professor and deputy chair of the, this hospital um, for digestive diseases. He received his degrees at the same university and also a postdoc training in Nottingham. And he serves as a, a, a vice president of the Chinese Society um, uh, of Gastroenterology. And he's also a member of the executive committee of the w WGO and um, is the General Secretary of the Asian Pacific Association of Gastro. He has published many papers um, and does a lot of research work on gastric cancer, who, uh, for which he has received um, state first class award for science and technology in China. So I look forward very much um, on his um, last talk on the quality assurance in the colorectal screening program. Please, Professor Wu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, there's a video there. Good afternoon. My name is Kai Chun Wu from the 4th Military Medical University, Xi'an, China. My part is quality assurance of CRC screening program. In this part, we have four statements the first one, statement 20, the quality of a FIT program depends on the adherence to initial testing and the follow-up 
of the testing result. We'll know that the colorectal cancer screening is not a single test, but a, a program with various steps which need to be compliant and also follow up. For instance, the initial test with the um, FIT gives the uh, uh, positive results and uh, further assessment, assessment by colonoscopy should be done to get the effective colorectal cancer screening result. Let's look at the uh, results of the colorectal cancer screening program happened in the Nether Netherlands in 2019. There were target population of 2.2 million and uh, the uh, actual uh, participation was 1.5 million which gives the uh, participation, participation rate of 71% and out of those uh, patients had uh, uh, a positive FIT result uh, 4.3% 4. 4. were uh, recommended for colonoscopy and uh, there were uh, 86 of, of them actually did colonoscopy and they get 1.4% uh, of the detection rate of colorectal cancer or advanced adenoma. Whereas in the Asia Pacific region, either in the Australia or in Japan, Korea, or, or Taiwan, there were only uh, uh, six, uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the participate, participation participate uh, rate for uh, FIT test, and uh, uh, only 60 to 70 percent of the participation rate to colonoscopy, which are much lower than the ones in Europe. That means there are uh, a, a big number of non-compliers in the Asia Pacific region. And we know that non-compliance with the col colonoscopy after positive FIT doubles the risk of dying from colorectal cancer. You can see from these figures over 10 years time the non-compliers get a higher incidence of colorectal cancer and uh, the motility increased uh, almost the 100 percent so that shows the quality of a feed program depends on adherence but how soon the colonoscopy should be done after a positive FIT in a CRC uh, screening program. In this study from Italy by over 3 million of the patient uh, participants participate in 
the screening program. This is a FIT based screening program. You can see only after the 270 days, the there's a nearly two fold of increase of the CRC being found. So in conclusion of this uh, uh, large study, to the post uh, FIT colonoscopy after ten, uh, nine months was associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer. Another study showed a similar results with the follow up after 10 months was associated with the higher risk of colorectal cancer and the more advanced stage disease at time of diagnosis. And also uh, uh, there's study uh, from the United States showing delay in diagnostic colonoscopy after a positive FIT might lead to a higher CRC incidence and also um, the more CRC deaths. So the statement 21 recommended the timely colonoscopy, preferably uh, less than three months time after positive FIT in the CRC screening program should be offered and uh, monitored. But why patient or people won't adhere to the uh, uh, program? So there's uh, some barriers to stop people from being particip uh, from participating in the uh, CRC screening. The major or the most important uh, barriers are lack of uh, awareness, uh, negative view of cancer, negative attitude towards CRC screening test, and uh, also lack of motivation are the fact. If you want to know the predictor of the non-adherence to uh, follow-up uh, procedures, that is the lack of comprehension about the test. However, the fact associated with the greater willingness to undergo diagnostic colonoscopy are higher socioeconomic status, higher perceived threat, high cure of action, low perception, perceived barriers, and the higher health behavior scores. So um, people are uh, encouraged to uh, learn uh, what are the barriers and what are the facilitators for, uh, for increase the adherence or compliance to the uh, CRC screening participation, like uh, increase the uh, public education, encourage uh, physician recommendation in the social ne network or self-motivation. Also, those barriers should be removed or reduced. And uh, also the quality control 
of uh, FIT and uh, colonoscopy is uh, uh, important for colorectal cancer screening program. The assurance of the quality of uh, FIT can secure the effectiveness of the entire screen, screening program. Because uh, there are many factors can affect the performance of uh, FIT, like the collection tube, buffer, temperature, and uh, the time uh, of uh, uh, stool collection and uh, uh, assaying in the in the laboratory, and even the different brands of FIT gives different result. So um, it's important to monitor the performance of uh, FIT at a regional or uh, national level with the short term or the long term indicators like uh, the positivity rate, detection rate of CRC interval, uh, CRC after negative FIT. But for the colonoscopy, um, it varies between uh, individual program institutes and the endoscopists. Um, the quality of endoscopy is important. Then the, the benchmarkers are required for colonoscopy performed among FIT positive individuals. For the ben, uh, a benchmarker, the adenoma detection rate is the one uh, show uh, uh, the importance. The increased rate of the adenoma detection associated with the decreased the risk of colorectal cancer and the deaths. So monitoring and the auditing together with the continued training programs and uh, accreditation systems will be indispensable to sustain high quality colonoscopy screening for colorectal cancer. So this gives us the last uh, statement, um, 23. The quality control of uh, FIT and colonoscopy is mandatory for CRC screening programs and the benchmarks should be determined which is uh, the adeno, uh, adeno, uh, adenoma detection rate. This, um, with, with that, I would like to uh, close. With that, um, I would close the um, quality assurance of CRC screening program. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wu, for the uh, presentation on colonoscopy quality. So we still have um, five or six minutes for discussion. So uh, may I take this occasion to ask uh, Dr. Matsuda? Uh, we know that fit positive cases had uh, a higher likelihood of having advanced neoplasm and uh, synchronous adenoma. So it is very reasonable to assume uh, there will be a higher likelihood of overlooking 
uh, any kind of adenoma. So uh, do you think that uh, in fit positive cases after either after negative colonoscopy or after polypectomy, uh, people should be um, monitor or surveillance in the same way as primary screening colonoscopy or should have a different surveillance interval? How do you think? Thank you, Hamo. Uh, this is very important, uh, important point. Uh, ideally, uh, we should divide into the high risk population. It means they're fit positive patient and individuals and the others. However, at the moment, the guideline is not uh, stated about this issue. Therefore, uh, we need more, we need more de uh, uh, clinical data uh, difference between fit positive and negative. From our Japan Oshima studies data, the five times higher uh, compared with uh, fit negative pa patient uh, uh, focused on advanced neoplasia incident prevalence. So therefore, it's a, I agree with your idea. Uh, we should divide the uh, different uh, di interval should be different, uh, di uh, divided into for high risk population, uh, fit positive and the negative patient. It's a very imp important point. Thank you. Yeah, I, I saw in your first uh, presentation slide, there was a 0 0.20s 3% of the subject yes. had a PCCRC, right? So uh, how about the magnitude? Is it higher uh, than the primary, uh, the PCCRC in primary screening colonoscopy setting in terms of 1,000% uh, year? Higher? Or... Uh, I showed you that 0.23% is a uh, uh, cancer detection rate uh, among ah, the whole, okay. mm -hmm. whole subject screening po population. Uh, so cancer detection rate at uh, worse, 0.23%, uh, yes. So I think you're raising a very interesting point, uh, Anmo, because this is one of the debates in my country as well, especially after a negative colonoscopy for a, a patient with a positive fit. Um, so should we go back to screening in 10 years, as you would think that a colonoscopy should protect for at least 10 years if you don't see any, any lesions in a quality assured program? Or should you, you reduce this, this interval because of the fit positivity, meaning probably a higher risk upfront as well? I, I'm, I'm curious for your both opinions. Do you indeed, do you have any data or any advice here? Yeah, uh, what I have in my hand is a uh, very uh, old cohort, uh, the initial five-year screening cohort in Taiwan. And uh, in that cohort, we uh, we found that those who had under, underwent uh, fit screening after negative colonoscopy had the lower risk of uh, instant colorectal cancer compared with those who just waiting for 10 years surveillance. So uh, although that... Uh, in in that that period, we our colonoscopy quality is insufficient. Yeah, to to yeah. be honest, yeah. So uh, I'm not sure whether our result is also uh, applicable to other settings with higher colonoscopy quality. But I think if you are not so confident on the colonoscopy quality um, in your program, maybe we can provide a fit. Uh, for those who had a negative colonoscopy because 10 years is a very long uh, time. But basically, I agree with the three-year uh, surveillance interval for those with uh, large adenoma or, or more than three adenoma, uh, considering the natural course of advanced neoplasm progressing into invasive cancer. Yeah, Professor Masuda, remark yes. or...? Yeah, I to uh, totally agree with your idea. Uh, quality of colonoscopy is very important. Actually, our Japan project study did not limit the endoscopies to experts, but limited the number of facilities as institution to 11, uh, therefore mainly high volume centers. Therefore, uh, the quality may be higher than the general uh, colonoscopy levels. Therefore, uh, when we discuss about the interval after negative colonoscopy, it's very important to focus on the quality of colonoscopy. Yeah. Okay, can, can, can I ask a question from uh, Hamo sure. and uh, Masuda? Yeah, um, uh, you know, uh, in my talk, I mentioned that uh, in our Asian Pacific regions, uh, the um, uh, particip participation rate 
or the uh, uh, the colonoscopy uh, participation rate, but, uh, and, and the both are lower than the ones you got uh, in, in in the Netherlands, the Netherlands, you know, um, Professor Decker. Uh, um, um, to how to um, improve this? Um, probably one of the uh, uh, the the uh, the point. Yeah. Um, uh, Hemo and uh, Masuda just mentioned that was the the, uh, uh, the quality of the colonoscopy. So um, uh, my question is that do you use the um, uh, ADR uh, as a routine uh, uh, benchmark to 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 test the quality um, or, or or not? Or what's your opinion, uh, Professor Decker, as well? Yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, in Taiwanese program, uh, we have been monitoring the ADR from the beginning of the program, and we observed the ADR is rising uh, dramatically um, in the past 15 years. And uh, we also observed a, a progressive decline of PCCRC. So I, I think monitoring ADR is very, very important. And also responding to your, your another question, uh, the uh, compliance to colonoscopy after positive fit. Uh, this is especially important in the COVID-19 um, pandemic. So what we have done in Taiwanese program is that we um, we intensively refer those with higher measurement of fit, higher hemoglobin concentration, because they had a much higher likelihood of cancer and the large adenoma. So in our university hospital, we observed uh, after intensive referral of those with high fecal hemoglobin concentration, we detected the same number of colorectal cancer compared with uh, 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 before the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, I think if you don't have uh, so many colonoscopy capacity, maybe you can um, more intensively refer those with higher concentration. This will uh, 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 improve the efficiency of referral. Yes. Thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, from Japan, uh, uh, regarding the quality uh, insurance, uh, quality uh, indicator of colonoscopy, is, I, I think ADR is easy to use, but when we discuss about ADO, we need to uh, discuss about the background of the patient or individuals, because we, if we try to the elder or male patient people, of course, the ADR will be higher than the other population. Therefore, uh, so uh, anyway, in Japan now, is uh, we are now ongoing to make a Japan endoscopy database uh, to monitor the uh, colonoscopy. And uh, so therefore, uh, we need. We are now discussing about uh, indicators, how uh, ADR, or there are some some uh, parameters. Therefore, um, but anyway, at the moment, ADR is a standard one. And uh, one more question is about uh, uh, fit positive populations uh, participation rate of diagnost as diagnostic colonoscopy mm -hmm. rate is about uh, in Japan about less than seventy percent, maybe less than uh, the Netherlands, maybe. So it's. It's a very important point to improve the uh, program of correct cancer screening. Therefore, the campaign for Japanese people is a wonderful option, but at, unfortunately, at the moment, it's not so successful. So this is my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so I have one comment on that as well. So we do a lot of quality monitoring in, in my country. We started for the colonoscopy uh, quality in our population screening in 2014. We are also doing now uh, quality of colonoscopy monitoring in all other colonoscopies in my country. We have a registry for that as well. So we are doing lots of work. And actually, I think the last point I would like to make is um, that recently we published our paper in um, Lancet Gastroenterology and Hepatology on um, the um, the parameter of proximal serrated polyp detection rate. And what we found is that the, uh, the this rate for endoscopists is like ADR, also related to um, the, uh, the occurrence of uh, post-colonoscopy colorectal cancers. And interestingly, 
they were not often not always correlated. So there were endoscopists very good in, in detecting adenomas, but but not at all good in in um, in serrated polyps, and also the other way around. So we highlighted that we think both parameters are, are relevant for um, monitoring the quality. Of course, this takes effort to, to have your registry ready for that. On the other hand, the advantage of proximal serrated polyp detection rate is that it's the, the pathology is not as important as it would be if you would you would monitor, for example, sessile serrated lesions, because then there's more confusion. So that would be my remark on that. There was one, we, we need to close off, but I would feel bad by not having a Finlay McRae's um, uh, last question. Um, and um, I, I don't know who could answer this best, um, but his question is, should uh, patients with a subthreshold but positive fit be treated differently in a screening program? So for example, if their level is just not high enough for being fit positive, should they come uh, back earlier um, for screening or, or something else. Maybe this is a question for Hamo. Yes, answer. yes, I, I can answer. So we have uh, previously, we published a study showing that even under the positive uh, cutoff, uh, those who had higher uh, hemoglobin concentration uh, had had a, a higher risk of developing advanced nail problem in the subsequent years. So maybe we can uh, still use the measurement to stratify people uh, into higher and low risk. And those with uh, higher risk, even under the uh, positive cutoff, uh, maybe you can ask them to come earlier for next screening. And those with yeah. lower level, maybe you can extend to a three year or four years. Yeah. 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 So I think indeed this is a very interesting evolution in uh, in fit screening programs, right? To try to integrate not only the current fit. Uh, results, uh, but also the previous ones, and maybe also gender and age and and other risk factors that are readily available or otherwise available via questionnaires. But then, of course, there's always a participation issue. So I really enjoyed. Um, as always, discussion time is too little. Um, it would have been nice to ask questions to Professor Lin as well and to all the others. But um, I hope we will have another occasion in the future. So I really enjoyed sharing this session on behalf of uh, WEO Colorectal Cancer Screening Committee. Um, it was a great joy to do this together with um, my colleague uh, Han Mo Chu. And I was extremely happy with all the, the high quality presentations um, uh, from all the different speakers for which I, I thank you a lot. So maybe the last remark is for Han Mo. Yeah, yes. I also want to express my sincere thanks to Professor Kai Zhong Wu for his strong support for, for this session. And without his yeah, strong support, uh, we cannot make this session happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.